behind the carnival atmosphere of a political campaign, there is usually a quest. It's what makes people sit in stuffy auditoriums, come out to airports, and stand in endless lines. People come to see the candidates with questions in their minds. Questions and sometimes the beginnings of an answer. One of the most rewarding things about a campaign is the chance to get out and to see the people. It's a chance to talk. I don't mean speeches. I do that all year. But in a campaign, I can really talk with people. And I get a chance to listen to them and to hear what they're thinking and feeling. What you hear from people in our cities today is a concern about the quality of life, the quality of their buildings, their streets, their homes and schools, even the quality of the water they drink and the air they breathe. Yeah, but uh, we found that uh, the general feeling around the neighborhood over the past couple of years is far more accepting of new ideas. I think people are willing to accept these changes and uh, find that the world that they were born in is not the world that they're going to die in. I sense that. I, 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 I it's there in black neighborhoods, too. The people here care. They care intensely and desperately about their community. Listening to any one of them can bring those hopes and concerns across in a way that no report or official survey ever could. I think that, the, that this country is not going to be what it ought to be until the black man has the right to control his own destiny, until he has his own banks, until he has a chance for his own stores, his own ownership, his jobs that are based on merit. You know, like we don't only go to the pool room and shoot pool anymore, we go to dig what's going on, you know. Like uh, even when, you, when they talked about uh, uh, home rule for this city, you know. You know, we should have home room for this city. You know, like we should control our own police departments. We should control Participation, commitment. Exactly. I hear those words again and again in the vocabulary of youth on thousands of college campuses across this nation. It's not just the old college bull session anymore. Today, young men and women are facing the real tough questions and looking for real answers. The problem that I felt, you know, with the ghettos and all is education, not only in the ghettos, but throughout the world, if we can educate the masses in uh, just simple tasks about how to live, how to act, that's, that's part of uh, that's some, getting over the uh, a big obstacle. These young people want to be in on creating the future. They want to change, and they want to move faster, much faster than we ever have. That's exciting. I think it's the beginning of something, and I think it's the, the new America. About the only two groups left who must be up with the sun and moving are farmers and presidential candidates. There's a lot of America to cover, but Humphrey knows that a man has to get out of Washington to keep touch with the hundreds of towns and cities that shape the American grain. What goes against the grain of a farm family? Violence does, and lawbreaking, and bigotry and injustice. But lately, they've been hearing that you've got to choose one or the other. Voices shrill that the only answer to a riot is a bullet. Others cry that progress comes out of a Molotov cocktail. Hubert Humphrey knows there's a better choice. 
He was raised by a father who didn't believe in taking no for an answer. Like father, like son. Humphrey ran for mayor against the Minneapolis machine and was told he couldn't win. He won. He was told that no one could turn the city's police force into a strong and honest one. He did. His family was threatened when he declared war on local racketeers. The Humphreys survived. The racketeers didn't. He started job training for the city's unemployables and reduced the relief rolls by 90%. Ignoring advice, he went on radio with a one-man campaign against anti-Semitism. No city in America had a fair employment practices law until the Humphrey administration passed one. In 1948, Humphrey electrified the Democratic Convention by proposing a civil rights plank. He was warned he'd be hounded out of the hall. But after the threats and screaming, the young mayor had the votes. And it wasn't Humphrey who left that year, he ran for the Senate with Harry Truman, another man who was not supposed to win, but they did. 1948, a young governor named Stevenson and two freshman senators named Douglas and Humphrey. They had things in common. All three were tagged as liberals. The tag should also have read leaders. Humphrey understood that his constituents' problems started with basic things like health, he proposed Medicare before the word was ever coined. Farmers found that the senator's ideas went far beyond subsidies and quotas. His food for peace plan turned a burden into an asset for America. During the 50s, Humphrey kept fighting for so-called impractical ideas, ideas like a nuclear test ban, a peace corps, a job corps. His relationship with President Kennedy brought Senator Humphrey closer than ever before to White House decision-making. Colleagues in the Senate, political rivals in the 60 primaries, Jack Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Hubert Humphrey were an effective team in the legislative battles of the new frontier. Humphrey now saw many of his long worked for programs voted into law. As vice president, he would soon play a role in carrying out those programs. 1964, President Johnson had chosen as running mate a man he described as best suited to succeed him as president. On the night he was nominated, Humphrey challenged all those who said no to progress. He singled out one naysayer in particular. Most Democrats and most Republicans in the Senate voted for education legislation but not Senator Goldwater. Most Democrats and most Republicans in the Senate voted for the National Defense Education Act, but not the temporary. <laughs> fellow Americans, most Democrats and most Republicans in the Senate voted to help the United Nations in its peacekeeping functions when it was in financial difficulty, but not Senator Goldwater. Most Americans agreed. The Johnson-Humphrey administration came into office with a mandate to find positive answers. The vice president rode herd on major domestic programs in space, in youth opportunity, and in job training. The Humphreys got used to traveling, representing our government at home and in a score of countries abroad. Goodwill ambassadors are often the targets of a lot of ill will. But Humphreys' efforts for the common man were well known in Europe. He was among friends. Face-to-face -face contact is basic to modern diplomacy and from Berlin to London, the vice president carried on much of this nation's dialogue with heads of state like Harold Wilson, or France's formidable Charles de Gaulle, the men who represent today's Europe. In Africa, Vice President Humphrey opened lines of communication with young nations and their leaders. 
He gained first-hand knowledge of their problems and aspirations and how they affect our role in Africa. Leaders like Kenya's Jomo Kenyatta are helping to shape the future of a continent. Humphrey sought their vision of that future. In 1968, the president's decision to retire confronted Humphrey with a personal challenge. Once again, he said yes to the future. At his home in Waverley, Humphrey pondered the questions he was determined to answer. Questions about the 1970s. He began a series of seminars with his staff, writers, researchers, aides. Subject, America. That's an old saw and that's an old trick. Most people react from fear. It's very easy to get people to act out of hatred, out of fear, out of bitterness. And there are two kinds of people in the world, two kinds of leaders. The people that lead through fear and the people that lead through hope. I'm not a fear man. I don't believe in preaching the doctrine of fear. I never did. And if we just spread the doctrine of fear, we can't win. Nixon knows more tricks about frightening people than Humphrey ever will. I believe the only moral justification for this government, for a church, or anything else is what it does to enrich man's life. This is a living people, a living constitution. We, the people, do establish and ordain, not did, but the living constitution, the living nation, the preciousness of life, and not just life for survival, as I said, but life that is meaningful. Everything emanates from that. Our hatred of war, our abhorrence of violence, our love of music, art, culture, everything, education, it all comes from that central principle. People are what are important. And the reason they're important is because they're different from just flesh and blood and bone. They got something called spirit. That's what we keep referring to. Some people call it soul. Some people call it the spark of the divine. Some people believe that all, they have all kinds of theological interpretations. But whatever it is, we're different. We're not pigs and cows and horses and animals. We are people. And if we are what we've been told we are and what I think we are, then we ought to make our, we ought to bend the institutions of government for one purpose and one purpose only. And we've heard it so many times that the only legitimate objective of government is the health and the well-being of the people. I think Jefferson said the health, well-being, and happiness of the people. It's tough to be a Jeffersonian these days. But he understood what the purpose of government was. A man running for the presidency finds himself looking towards the future, and at the same moment, trying to pull together decades of experience. Surely one of the lessons we've learned is that the commitments that you made 20 years ago in a world situation that prevailed then still are with you today. Some people think they plague you. Other, think of, other people say that they are just there. But the decisions that we made treaty-wise in CETO, in F Formosa, uh, in many other places, are commitments that were made at a different time, in a different set of circumstances. And yet they're there. Now, the next president of the United States may be making some commitments for his country. If he takes care of his duties, he undoubtedly will be making new commitments. He therefore must have a, almost a sense of prophecy. He must be able to look ahead he must seek the best advice that he can get as to what that future may be. He always makes a calculated bet. So my thinking in the field of foreign policy will be to have learned some lessons from the yesterday, good ones and maybe some bad ones, to profit from both, to try to envision the kind of a world that my grandchildren may live in as adults, that's what I want us to think about. The battle for the presidential nomination now presented the Democrats with a perplexing but enviable problem. Three good candidates. First in the field had been Humphrey's fellow Minnesotan, Senator Eugene McCarthy. 
Robert Kennedy, the freshman senator from New York, brought a formidable personality and a brilliant record into the campaign. All three men were qualified and committed. People listened and heard one of the healthiest sounds that a free society can make, the voices of leaders discussing the nation's urgent business. On June 6th, one of those voices was silenced. It was a time for quiet thought. Out of it, for some, came resolution. I feel all of us have an even greater responsibility now to confront those problems that Senator Kennedy and so many of us cared about so deeply. The real battle is between those of us who see modern life as a journey of the human spirit and those who see it as some kind of franchise, men who see human need as an expendable item that doesn't fit their balance sheet. The campaign resumed. No vice president has ever traveled this country so extensively or come to know it so well. But campaigning in the Midwest is a series of homecomings for Humphrey. The man from Minnesota was actually born in South Dakota. He has a lot of hometowns here. The Depression kept his parents moving, trying to make a fresh start in little farm towns like Doland. The young people are leaving Dolan. The town's little weekly newspaper records fewer births every year. There are fewer farms, fewer jobs. Hubert Humphrey knows what lies ahead for towns like Dolan. The train only stops here once a week now. Soon they'll drop the town altogether. The young will keep moving to the city, a city that doesn't need them. Humphrey wants to break that cycle. The urban crisis of today is the byproduct of a world crisis of today and yesterday, and you and I know it. People who couldn't make it, who didn't have a chance, thought there was a better chance someplace else, and they went there. I want to probe the future to see what can be done about lifting the quality and the attraction of rural life. I want to see a halt, or at least a slowdown, to the migration of people from our rural areas into our great cities. There's another migration that's been changing the face of this country, the move to the suburbs. The image of the average American used to be of someone who lived on a farm or in a small town. Today, he's the suburbanite, complete with mortgage, car, and probably a job with a major corporation. He's fairly well satisfied, but some things are worrying him. He worries about safe streets and good schools and colleges for his children. And to his surprise, he worries about the city and its problems, too. In this election, we've been told that his vote, the suburban vote, will be one for reaction and repression. Humphrey disagrees. People start by looking at the issues in a very personal way. To a suburban family, the resale value of their house, the level of their schools, those are really big issues. But in spite of what you hear and read about backlash and suburban reaction, these people do care about what's happening to their country and to their fellow countrymen. The message of the 20th century, Humphrey once said, is that there's no hiding place. Cities were meant to be beautiful, prosperous, safe, rich in culture. That's why men first moved to cities. But today, our cities are menaced by a pollution that reaches clear down into human emotions. Here live people whose every day is just a finger snap away from violence. I just left beautiful southeastern Minnesota, and I want to take you out there and show you some of the barns where animals are kept on an ordinary farm, not a rich man's farm, and then take you into the tenement districts of some of our great cities. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot justify this. There is no justification for it. It's a bad habit, that's all. And we have assumed because it's a habit, it will always be so. I like to own my own home. I think if private property is good for me, it's good for everybody. And most people go around heralding the wonders of private property, and then we develop ways and means to deny people a chance to have it. What prompts a man who lives in surroundings like these to devote a career to working for the inhabitants of tenements and marginal farms? Perhaps because Hubert Humphrey has a sense of life as something not to be endured, but enjoyed and exulted in by everybody. Humphrey knows that children are the future. He loses no chance to communicate with them. In this electronic age, the medium is often television. In this case, a children's program in Cleveland. Now, and I just, you know, just, uh, I get kind of scared, though, but you're nice. Well, let me tell you, Slim, that what makes you really feel good is when children like you. Do you, do you like, like children? And oh, vice presidents like children? I love children. Do I you? Have, uh, I have five granddaughters. Five granddaughters. And I have lots of friends amongst the little people. The, the children, they're just wonderful good friends of mine, and uh, they make me feel good when I'm sort of tired and uh, kind of, you know, like, uh, Dad mom gets a little grouchy right. once in a while by right? young folks come I in mean, they make it do. The White House's air of tranquility ends at the front door. No one knows that better than the president and the men who work around him. Vice presidents don't just cut ribbons and dedicate dams anymore. From his desk in the executive office building next door, Humphrey and his staff administer a battery of White House programs placed in his hands by the president or Congress. He's chairman of the National Aeronautics and Space Council, of the Peace Corps Advisory Council, and of the Council advising the Office of Economic Opportunity. President Johnson has also involved the Vice President in the coordinating and carrying out of all federal efforts in the fields of poverty and civil rights. Many of these programs are political hot potatoes, but Humphrey is in charge because the President knows he can do the job. Serving in the cabinet and on the National Security Council, Humphrey has shared many of the painful decisions the president must make. He knows that awaiting him may be a problem that has plagued three presidents, Vietnam. Ambassador Averill Harriman confers with the vice president on the progress of the Paris peace talks toward finding a lasting political solution for the problems of Vietnam. Both men know that the process will require great flexibility and patience. Patience is a word not in fashion with everyone on today's campuses. At the University of Arkansas, Humphrey gave definition to some other controversial words like patriotism and dissent. Fascists, communists, racists, cross burners, book burners, draft card burners, flag burners, all of them, every one of them, share a basic intolerance for the views of other individuals. Their next step... <laughs> the next step, and the most dangerous step, is intolerance for the rights of others. History is strewn with the tangled wreckage left by militant minorities, each of which thought it had cornered the market in social justice and virtue, and had discovered the true belief to the exclusion of all others. Freedom, precious. Freedom, as John Kennedy put it, is not cheap. Freedom and human development and peace are the products of a lifetime many lifetimes, and the products of small and often obscure acts undertaken by almost unknown individuals able to look beyond themselves. Adlai Stevenson once defined for us the true meaning of patriotism. He said it so beautifully as only he could. 
patriotism, said Adlai Stevenson, is not a short and frenzied outburst of emotion, but the tranquil and steady dedication of a lifetime. Questions echo in the minds of people who come to see the candidates. Is the choice offered America really a choice between revolution and stagnation? Hubert Humphrey has a different answer, a different vision of the kind of choice this country wants. There's a vast, silent majority of Americans, countless millions, who really want to make this country work. They're the non-violent majority. They want safety, and they want justice for everyone. And they want progress, too. But safety and justice and progress come out of this sense of community. They come out of a just society of laws and a fair society. Now, that's what we're working for. And that's the message that I read from the overwhelming majority of Americans. Begin the job of building that community now. That's the old America, and it can be the new America, too. <laughs>